corporate federalism is moving us into the heart of module two, uh, which is really the corporations and policy module. Now, of course, we've been discussing that up until now, although we've had a background of sort of corporate basics. Now we're really getting into some of the policy choices in terms of law. And uh, what we're going to talk about today are some aspects of what's called corporate federalism, which is the prospect that you could have a different corporate law across the several states, as well as some corporate law at the federal level. So there's state versus state competition for the best or the worst corporate laws, depending on how you see that. We'll call that the race to the bottom or the race to the top argument. And the fundamental lesson here, just to give it away at the beginning, is that corporate law is really about private choice. It's really, I teach two courses here. I teach contract, I teach venture capital also, but I teach two large doctrinal courses you'll find in the curriculum, and they have a common thread. I teach contracts and I teach corporations, and the common thread to both is both are about voluntary agreements. Now, how many of you have signed the Constitution? Right? None of you. None of you voluntarily agreed to be U.S. citizens. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. Some of you may have chosen that. Many of us were born here. Many of us are American citizens by birth, not by choice, maybe also by choice, but certainly by birth. We didn't sign the Constitution, but it's a document that governs us. There are state laws that govern us. I didn't vote for the speed limit on my road here to be 55 miles an hour. I would have gone with 70, you know? Uh, but there are laws that bind us even if we didn't agree to them. On the other hand, there are entire sets of laws that pertain to private agreements among people. And that's where my research is, that's where my focus is. That's a distinction between what you'd call a public law scholar and a private law scholar. I'm on the private law side of that. And so both contracts and corporations are about private choices, parties' choices, and also when the law respects those choices and when the law does not respect those choices. And you remember from contracts that there are certain contracts that are unenforceable. Contracts or contracts that cannot be upheld against a minor, for example. You can have a contract with a 17-year-old to sell him your car, but he can disavow that contract, and you can't hold that contract to him. And likewise, there are some public policy limitations in the world of corporations as well. And so it's not a matter of totally free choice. There are some things that you can do in a corporation. There are permissive rules, and there are some mandatory rules, some things that you must do. And states have competed to offer the best set of rules on those dimensions. And this competition goes all the way back to at least 1899, maybe earlier, but we'll kind of start the story there. We'll actually start the whole story a little earlier as we talk about these aspects. So as we go through this again, why are we doing this? What is our, our purpose here? Our purpose is to understand better before we deal with how to animate a corporation, how to do all the nuts and bolts, with, what, um, what my partner at the law firm would call the blocking and tackling, the day-to-day -day exercise of authorizing a corporation to act or to raise money or issue shares or dissolve are some more fundamental questions about what a corporation is. Is a corporation a person's private property? Well, yes, it is in some ways. You can own a corporation. If you're a shareholder, you own a percentage of that corporation, and that corporation is your property, and there's due process. You can't be deprived of your property without due process. The Constitution has an overlay to that. But the corporation is also a social institution. Why? Because states permit the formation of corporations. They don't have to. Corporations are not like children. You don't need the state of Delaware to have a child, as many of you have noticed in your child rearing without Delaware. Right? You don't need Delaware's permission or anyone's permission. However, you do need a state's permission to have a corporation. Now that's a separate entity. Just like a child is a separate entity, has a separate social security number, a corporation's a separate entity with its EIN number, and it's your property. But the difference is that that is an artificial entity, not a natural entity. And the state reserves some rights to cancel that entity at their pleasure, and as a result, maintain some control. So I'll give you a very brief history. You probably have heard some of this history at some uh, uh, point in time. But the concept of aggregating money for profit is pretty old. People have been pooling resources to make money for a very long time. And this goes all the way back to uh, the East India Company, but it really mattered in America 
uh, starting around at 1789 when we had our first constitutional convention. At that time, at that time, there were about five corporations in America. Five corporations were chartered in America at the time of our constitutional convention. That's a very small number, as you can imagine. So why so few? Well, in early history, forming a corporation, forming this special entity, was really a difficult privilege. It required an action by a state legislature, and as a result, was granted very infrequently, and usually to people's friends. You had to be a real political person to get a corporation. And in fact, interesting fact, a corporation was essentially equivalent to a monopoly. As you can imagine, there's only five companies in America, right? So they have basically a monopoly on what they want to do. What's another way that the government grants a monopoly? Gives you the sole authority to operate in the commercial sphere. If you hold one of these, you are the only one who can commercialize this invention. Yeah. A patent. A patent is another type of legal monopoly for 17 years, and that period actually can change, but essentially 17 years. You have the exclusive right to produce a certain kind of technology. Now, this is valuable. Why? Why do we have the patent system? Well, it incentivizes development of things. You might not spend your efforts creating a easy to copy drug, pharmaceutical drug, if by creating that drug someone could make a generic version cheaper, just like that. You would not recoup your, your initial investment. So the patent system was a way to encourage people to innovate. Early corporations were called patents because they also came with a monopoly to do that line of business in the corporate form. And we will see that that was certainly true of one of our oldest corporations the South Sea Company. In 1719, the South Sea Company was uh, engaged in um, trading tea with India and, uh, and was, was operating out of England and essentially was the only corporation that was able to engage in this activity. Uh, and uh, it engaged in some nefarious business. Which is unsurprising. Whenever you have a monopoly, whenever you have this sort of concentration of power, it tends to result in certain abuses. History has shown that time and again. So the South Sea Company uh, had this exclusive right to raise funds in this, in, this, in this format, and it actually created a uh, what's called a bubble. It inflated the value of its own shares by promising that they would strike it rich with their trade with their trade. And the result of this activity was a fairly poorly written law called the Bubble Act of 1720 that essentially forbade this type of activity. This is back in 1720, so uh, it was actually called, this is the full title uh, in England, an act to restrain the extravagant, un unwarranted practice of raising money by voluntary subscriptions for carrying on projects dangerous to the trade and subjects of this kingdom. So the Bubble Act was a response to abuse of the corporate form early on. And this concept of raising money through the corporate form really has persisted throughout time. Uh, this is actually a coin of the East India Company. So corporations have minted their own currency, as, as states did at various times. Uh, but in this early period, again, the overall concept was it was very hard to get permission to form a corporation because you would need an act of the legislature and they tended to give it to their friends, to their political friends. So you had to be on the right side of the political divide to get this monopoly. And as we know from uh, antitrust, that the danger of monopoly is you can extract wealth from society, you can put it in your own pockets, although it causes harm to society in the process. So people wanted these, but they were limited in number for a while. Uh, however, starting in uh, 1888, New Jersey created one of the first statutes in the world that essentially authorized anyone to create a corporation simply by filing the right paperwork. And Delaware follow, followed with its own Delaware General Corporation Act as long ago as 1899. And that's really where our story begins because New Jersey uh, ended up sort of reneging on its liberal uh, ability to form corporations. and. Um, I think it was actually Woodrow Wilson, who was governor of New Jersey at the time, that they, they rescinded from that position. 
And since 1899, Delaware has become the preeminent place to form a corporation in large part because at that time it was the only place an average ordinary person could form a corporation. You wouldn't have to go through all the machinations of getting legislative approval. It was a, an, an advent in uh, an, an more liberal and modern corporation law. Now I'm cutting out a lot in the middle for those who are interested. Quite a bit happened in the 1800s. There were several stock bubbles and crashes in the 1800s in America. There was the development of the telegraph. There was the emergence of stock markets. But, but I want to get us to, to modern times. So we're thinking now 20th century, early 20th century. And Delaware begins this process of permitting people to form artificial entities at will, essentially, with very, very few requirements and at reasonably low cost. <clears throat> And, uh, and this raises some now some very interesting and important questions about what these entities are. And we talked a little bit about this. We talked a little bit about whether corporations are seen as a web of contracts or whether they're seen as a separate entity or as a drama, a, a stage on which human behavior is played out. Uh, but it really didn't matter that much until they were much more available to people. And that's how Delaware got its start in the business. Now the question that we'll come back to throughout this session today is, is Delaware's law good then? I mean, it's popular, and Delaware has become the popular place to form a corporation. So one thing you'll ask and we'll ask is, does that mean they have really good laws? Or does that mean they created a really bad law, maybe, and they have like the loophole that everyone's walking through? It's not really clear. Those theories are called the race to the top, suggesting that this competition among states to have the best state law has resulted in very good state law, with Delaware being really the example to the world of the very best corporate law. And others saying that the people who run corporations are simply looking to screw over their shareholders and Delaware has made that the easiest for them. So that's where they choose to go. So those are open questions. You can make up your own mind about that. It's really an unresolved question. So <clears throat> in both of these cases uh, of, the, of the modern uh, corporation, we have these questions about whether or not the uh, People who run it should have the, the unbridled ability to control its actions and its destiny. One limitation, and I'm, I'm going to put this out here and come back to it, uh, one limitation to the unbridled ability of managers, however, you might say, well, we don't want the state to give directors of corporations unbridled ability to do whatever they would want with a corporation. Well, there are some limits, and that limit is that shareholders if they're unhappy with how things are run, if they really are getting screwed over, they could vote, sue, or uh, sell. Right? And for that matter, uh, it's possible that if a corporation is doing very poorly, that, that will cause a lot of shareholders to sell their stock. So if Delaware, let's, let's just assume, just for the sec sake of argument, that Delaware has really crappy corporate laws that have allowed managers to run amok and take advantage of shareholders. They create this entity, they take their money, and they bamboozle them willy-nilly. Well, if that's happening to you, right, Mary Beth, if, if you realize that you have $100 invested in Microsoft and, and they're, they're stealing it, or you think they're stealing it, you'll sell those shares, wouldn't you? Yeah, you sell those shares, you put them back in your pocket, you go invest in Papa John's instead. Okay, <laughs> maybe not Papa John's, right? So what happens when Mary Beth sells a share of stock? What happens to that stock? What's the rule of supply and demand? Yeah, Joe. Someone buys it. Someone buys it, right? So if, well, in order for her to sell it, someone has to buy it. So if lots of people are unhappy with Microsoft, and so lots of people go, I'd like to sell, I'd like to sell, I'd like to sell, what happens to the price of the stock? Yes? It goes down. It would go down, right? The law of supply and demand says we've just increased the supply, right? More people want to sell. We've decreased the demand. The price will go down. If enough people sell, that price can go down quite a lot. In fact, it could theoretically go to zero. Question. Uh, I understand the supply and demand, but who sets the price of each share of stock, like the dollar value? Ah, who sets the price? So the concept is the market sets the price. So that probably takes a little explanation. Let me think of how to explain that. So, well, let me ask you this. Do you have a house? Did you? You bought that house, right? You bought it on the market. So who set the price of that house? The seller. Well, they named a price, but 
what if they made the price too high? Have you seen houses that were priced too high and they didn't sell? They sat on the market for 100 days, 200 days, 300 days? What happens to those houses that are sitting on the market for 200 days? What usually happens to the price? They lower the price, right? They lower the price and lower the price because it turns out that while, while a seller can, can have a limit, can say, I'm not selling for less than this, they can't actually force the sale at that price. There has to be a willing buyer on the other end. There's an expression in real estate that a house is worth what? But someone will pay for it. So how do you set the price of a house? Well, you try to estimate what the price should be based on comparatives in the marketplace. Well, my house is on a quiet street and has four bedrooms. And here's a house on a quiet street with four bedrooms that sold for 100,000. So I think my house is also worth 100,000. I'll ask for 120 because it has an updated kitchen. You can ask for a price and, and, and then there's different concepts here. Like if you set a price of 120, that's called anchoring where someone then establishes that that's like a normal price. And there's other kinds of uh, marketing and psychology. But someone has to come around and say it's really worth that. And they might say, that house is worth that price because it's the best I can get for $120,000. But what happens if your neighbor next to you puts their house in the market for $80,000? Let's say you have a row house. Each house is identical. You want to sell your house for one hundred and twenty. dollars The neighbor next to you with an identical house puts it on the market for eighty. dollars Identical house. Is anyone going to pay you one hundred and twenty dollars when they can walk next door and get the one for eighty? dollars No. No. And so, again, the what's happening here, the market is setting the price. Right? And with a large enough market, you start to get accurate prices. Now, a house is not bought and sold very often, but stock is. Stock is sold millions of times a day. And so there's, it used to be literally open outcry pits where people used various weird hand signals. It's actually kind of neat when you think about it to communicate numbers in tens and hundreds and thousands and, and actually offer, make offers and, and accept prices. That now happens all electronically. But essentially, if you go to sell your Microsoft stock for $100 and there are no takers, you start moving down until somebody is willing to buy it. And that's what I mean by the market setting the price. You might, make an, you might make an offer, but someone has to accept that offer. And when you have a million transactions a day or, or hundreds of millions of transactions a year, the market goes through a process called price discovery. And the concept is that all the information about that company is projected into that price. I used to make, and I will make again just for fun, but I'm aware this is, and now I'm aware of this is very unhelpful. I used to make a very unhelpful analogy to the surface of a black hole, because obviously if you don't understand what I'm talking about with markets, you would understand astrophysics. But the concept is that everything that falls into a black hole is not lost, but the information is on its event horizon. And, and similarly, the price is, is meant to also similarly reflect that. All the information that is funneled into a company is revealed when you see what that price is. You know what that, comp what that company's value is because you know that people thought it was worth 100 and bid that much or, or bid less. And so the price is actually supposed to reveal quite a bit. Yeah? And answer your question a little bit? The market sets the price was the short answer for those of you who are just looking for the short answer. You can ask whatever you want, but you won't necessarily get it. Yeah. So you actually go online and ask, you put your price if you're the seller. Yeah, there's something called a bid and an ask. And there's a bid and an ask spread. That spread is infinitesimally small for frequently traded stocks because there is a known price, but uh, there is a bid and an ask price. And then the, the market would take the, uh, the, the stock market would take the, the difference in the spread. Yeah. And the market selling, right? Where you can just tell whoever, the e trade or whatever, sell this. And whatever the first price is they get, they get. Right. There, so, um, so Joe's asking a little bit more of an investment question, which is how do I, more of a how-to question. How do I sell stock? There are different ways to sell stock. You can sell it at the market price, which means that you're going to go and you say, I have, I have one share of Microsoft, and I tell the computer, I tell E-Trade, I tell the system, uh, whoever the next buyer that comes along asking the market price, I'll sell it at that price. You can also set a limit price, right? And a limit price would say that if the, if the stock falls this amount or rises this amount, I will sell it or I will buy it. So, you know, you might hold Microsoft and you're worried that Apple's announcement today is going to push Microsoft's price down. And so you might be prepared for that and you might have a limit order in that says that if Microsoft, which is now 100, falls to 95, I'll sell. Right? Or you might have it the other way. If it falls to 95, you might buy, thinking it's a value. Now, you might also ask how do people determine, you know, what, what is the information they base this on? There's, there's a lot of features about a corporation. I, I had, I was going to post some earlier. Uh, it was a bit technical. I was trying to compare Nike and other companies, but they, they look at things like price to earning ratio, for example. It's called PE ratio. It's a very common metric. And that asks basically 
what is the price per share of stock divided by how much money this company makes? Now, you would want a higher, a higher ratio means the stock is very expensive relative to how much that company is really bringing in. Twitter has a famously bad price to earnings ratio because they don't earn a lot of money. They really uh, are not profitable. Uh, but some companies that are more focused on fundamentals, you, you look at things like uh, General Electric or Caterpillar, right? they tend to have good price to earnings ratios. For what it's worth, Nike's wasn't very good recently. But um, people use all kinds of information like that. They would go over deeply through the earnings statements, and some of it is, is based on gut. So we have a video to see later, um, and I have an article uh, online uh, that says that you should buy Tesla. Anyone here know what the price of Tesla stock is today? It was 260. 260. It was up to 350 just a few weeks ago, and now it's at 260. So do you buy it or not? How do you decide whether or not to buy Tesla stock? Well, I mean, you could just look at the price and say, well, the price was here, now it's here, so I'll buy it. Okay, but it could also be going that way. You know, I mean, Elon Musk might be losing his marbles, right? That's like the talk here. Or, on the other hand, it might be artificially low because people are freaked out right now. So what do you look at? You look at what are the products in the pipeline. You look at whether or not Elon Musk has disavowed smoking marijuana and drinking whiskey on comedians' talk shows when he's being under securities an exchange commission investigation. Generally not a good idea, right? So, you know, you have a C you, you have Uber, right? This happened to, they're not, we were not public, but Travis Kalanick got himself into a lot of trouble. There was a question about who was the leadership going to be. All these things push down price. And, uh, and so all these questions come up. Uh, you know, you try to figure out what are the potential for future earnings? What does the competition look like? What's the macroeconomic conditions in the world? Um, you know, if, if uh, Tesla is getting most of its parts from Sri Lanka, and Sri Lanka is having a border dispute with, uh, with its neighboring country, you know, that might suggest that there's a supply chain issue in the future. There's all kinds of things like that. There's people who are paid to do that. And if you don't want to take all that time and trouble, you can just read their analyst reports. And if you want to take the time and trouble for that, you can just count the analyst reports and you can count how many recommend a buy, how many a hold, and how many a sell. Some people just do that. They say, well, there's 30 analysts who have wrote about Tesla, 21 say buy, eight say hold, one says sell, I'll buy. But it's a question of how close you want to get to the data and how, you know. Investing is not for the faint of heart, by the way. I, I, for that reason, I recommend being careful before you pick stocks. Yeah. Um, so when they set the IPO, is that the same way as whatever they want to be? That's a little different. Um, an IPO works a little differently. So an IPO stands for an initial public offering. And this is when a company goes from being large and private to public. And this is what we were talking about over here, right, about the uh, Uber uh, stockholders who are waiting for this moment where right now Kelly's getting 40 cents on the dollar for her 10 years of service. So with the exception of Google, that did a weird process called a double Dutch auction, I think it was called, or a Dutch auction, a weird concept where they sold each share individually for the same thing for different prices. You can look it up on eBay about how it works. You can sell... You can sell uh, commodities the same way, so long as they're um, fungible. Typically, you get involved with an underwriter. And an underwriter agrees to buy the shares from the company at a certain price with the intention of reselling them for a slightly higher price. So when a company goes public, it actually is selling all of its shares to a bank, like formerly like Lehman Brothers. And there are only a handful of companies in the world that engage in this sort of underwriting behavior. And they try to figure out what the price should be. Then they offer a company a price that is less than that to account for their services and for the risk that they take on. And then they will sell it to the public at a set price and its initial offering. So with Facebook, I think the numbers were something like, and don't quote me, but there was something like the underwriter paid $33 a share and sold them for $40 a share. And you would buy them $40 a share expecting a big bump at the IPO, of, you know, but actually that, in that case the price fell. So IPOs are a little different. Once they're trading freely on the market, the market kind of finds the price. Prior to that, they're using um, you know, complicated analytics. And, you know. That's why we don't have enough physicists in the world, because the banks, this is what physicists do now. People who are trained to like, do astrophysics and understand black holes instead use that to figure out math to determine what companies are worth. And, and a lot of them have gone to Wall Street to do that. I'm not qualified to opine further. Question, David. Yes, the underwriter would have to have all that cash, unless they did it with leverage. 
right? They could be playing a shell game rather than actually borrowing that money, but they might have a broad portfolio. But yes, underwriters have to have what we call in the industry a crap ton of money. Yeah. Yeah, we're talking about huge, mega, mega wealthy, 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 wealthy banks, a handful of the wealthiest, wealthiest banks with huge amounts of cash at their disposal. Yeah. In terms of the hospital takeover, I just don't get what, excuse me, what their primary motivation is. Is that just to basically replace the board? Why, why are they usurping the board? Well, <clears throat> let's go back to our story about Nike. And Nike is being sued right now for having a frat boy culture, I think was the term used in the complaint. I'll try to use the terms in the complaint. A lot of terms used in this kind of context. And the claim is that because of this frat boy culture, there was a lack of diversity, there were lawsuits, and this meant we, they weren't producing products at the level that they could, they weren't producing products for as diverse an audience, they were losing shareholder value. And these uh, 12 directors, I guess it were, who were on the board and the CEO, uh, have facilitated this culture. And so we're going to say that these 12 guys are at fault for making Nike a crummy place to work. And Nike should be worth a lot more than it is. And I'm harmed because they were out having cake parties when they should have been having diversity training. And as a result, the stock price is lower than it should be. I mean, that's essentially what the complaint amounts to. So if the stock price is low and I'm in the business of improving companies and I've got a as we said, a crap ton, I think was the technical term, right? I've got a crap ton of cash and I'm in the business of flipping companies like a hedge fund or um, you know, a, a private equity fund. I would say that Nike's fundamentals are good. It's the board that's the problem. The stock price is reflecting a bad board. So if I buy the stock now, I'm getting a good deal, right? The price is low because the board sticks. I'll buy the shares, get rid of the board, keep this great brand with their excellent marketing campaigns and a strong pipeline of products and a logistics network across the world and a whatever, and contracts with major sports teams. But once I replace the board and I make it, you know, 50% female and I add diversity training, I will eliminate the problems with the bro culture that have been depressing the stock price. And now I will buy it for 40. I will get rid of the board, the stock price by virtue of it being a better company, will go to 60, and I will have just made a 50% return on my investment in a short period. That's why I'd want to do that. Now, why is it hostile? It's hostile because the other way you buy a company is you go to the board of directors and you say, hi, would you sell me your company? And sometimes they will. I mean, there are, there are instances, of course, where, where companies are more than willing to sell or, or merge. That's sort of the practice of mergers and acquisitions. But in the case of Nike in particular, Tell me, why wouldn't the board want to sell the company? Because they're going to get fired. No one likes getting fired. Nobody. I mean, have you seen The Apprentice? Nobody likes that part, you know? But I know one guy who likes that part. But the person on the receiving end does not like getting fired, and directors are no different, right? They have an instinct. And they also get paid a lot for their jobs, and they probably think they're doing a good job. Occasionally, you get someone who resigns and says, I really did a terrible job running a company. But um, you've got guys on this board, by the way, including, uh, speaking of Apple, Tim Cook, right? He's on the Nike board, which is sort of interesting. Now, how do you think it looks for Tim Cook if he says, you know, you're right. I'm a really bad manager, right? So uh, there's a lot of reasons to engage in a hostile takeover, but they mostly revolve around feeling that you could do a better job running the company than the board is. And this activity increased in the 1980s. And the reason I had brought this up was uh, to, to talk a little bit about the concept of horizontal federalism. And I'm actually not going to talk very much about it because uh, horizontal federalism refers to the, the federal government uh, having a role in corporate law. Uh, corporate law is state law. And it used to be interesting that corporate law and the Constitution got involved with horizontal takeovers, but more recently, more recently, the federal government has gotten involved at a much, uh, at a much different level with things like the Dodd-Frank Act and requiring reporting and oversight and things like that. So I won't dwell too much on that. I, I use it mostly as a way to introduce the concept of hostile takeovers. Now there are rules about buying stock and there are rules about hostile takeovers. For example, Delaware has a rule that says if you're able to buy 90% of the stock, 
you can squeeze out the remaining 10% of shareholders. Sort of interesting. It's really, really hard to get to 100%. It's actually an economics problem. It's called the last mile problem. And it's also called the holdout problem. So here's the example. We're all shareholders of Microsoft. And the stock is currently trading at $50 a share. I say, Danielle, I'd like to buy your stock for $51 a share. It's trading at 50. She's just one small shareholder. So you think, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll sell that, right? And we start going around the room and maybe offer 52, 53, 54, right? But what happens, I'm tr let's say I have to get to 100%. It's all or nothing. I need 100% to control this company. I need to get rid of all of you guys. The last person in this room, right, as I finally get over to Amanda, who's still got her share of stock left, she's not going to want 51 anymore. She knows she can extract more value from that. In fact, you could extract all the remaining value. If I'm willing to buy Nike, let's say Nike's trading for a net, net of a billion dollars right now, so it costs me a billion to buy everyone out, and I'm willing to pay 1.5 billion, and Amanda knows that's my price point, I may have paid all of you $999 million, but she won't sell for anything less than, but well, we left 0.4 billion. And why shouldn't she, right? She can hold out. She can be that last piece of that. So Delaware has gotten around that because Delaware has recognized that it is somewhat important that management can be subject to turnover. It disciplines management. It keeps them honest. You know, if the Nike board were insulated, for example, if the Nike board were able to vote their own treasury shares and so would always vote for themselves, they may not be incentived, incentivized to put in the programs that they need to improve Nike. Right? They're not at risk of losing their jobs. And so the right balance is important and Delaware has created that balance for its companies. And the question here is whether or not, and here's the, this is the important lesson for the only really important doctrine for today is the internal affairs doctrine. So what do I mean by that? Well, Delaware has this rule and many other rules, right? When you're a Delaware corporation, you are governed by the Gen Delaware General Corporation Law. What happens if you do business in California? What happens if you do business in New York? What happens if you do business in Pennsylvania? Which law governs things like how do you vote for directors? And what happens in a hostile takeover? And can you have a 10% squeeze out merger in a two-step hostile uh, uh, tender offer process? And the Internal Affairs Doctrine is the doctrine that says that a corporation shall be governed by the state in which it's incorporated with regard to its internal affairs. So a couple things we have to understand then. We have to understand what does that mean, state of incorporation? What are the limits to that rule? And what do we mean by internal affairs? How are internal affairs different from external affairs? So internal affairs are predominantly voting of shareholders, when can shareholders vote? How do they vote? We'll talk about class voting, uh, straight voting and cumulative voting, as well as class voting and non-class voting, and the fiduciary duties of directors. Uh, other procedures for corporate actions about setting a board meeting or our ability not to set a meeting, and other issues involving the internal relationships. What do they not include? Well, they don't include things like um, your sales, right? So if Nike, uh, has uh, directors that are appointing a CEO, that's an internal affair. But if Nike is selling too many size 10 shoes, that's an external affair. Right? Not ha doesn't have to do with their, their corporate governance. And Delaware law doesn't talk about, well, I mean, a better example, let's go to Papa John's, a health and safety issue, right? So pizza has to meet certain health codes. You want to make pizza, you're subject to certain health codes. Any restaurant has certain, certain uh, health codes. Employees have to wash their hands after using the bathroom. Et cetera, et cetera, right? Has anyone here worked in a restaurant? There's a lot of health codes, right? And it would be pretty weird if you could have different health codes depending on where you were incorporated. It'd be pretty weird, right? I mean, maybe you would incorporate New Mexico, and, and New Mexico would have particularly favorable laws that didn't require you to wash your hands or something like that if you thought that was cheaper. Right? That would be a weird effect. And so internal affairs doctrine only governs things like how the corporation is managed. It doesn't govern things like your employment relationships and anything external. Uh, and so it's this doctrine that basically says that if you're incorporated in Delaware or in Pennsylvania or whatever other state you're in, other courts will respect your governance procedures 
and holds you to the laws of, of that state of incorporation. Why do this? Well, it provides uniformity. It provides predictability. And again, it goes back to that theme of private choice. If you choose to be a Delaware corporation and you choose to be an investor in a Delaware corporation, you know that there is this risk of a hostile takeover with a 10% squeeze out merger because it's in the code. Or more fundamentally, you would know in the case of McDermott, which are kind of one of our first cases for today, in the case that you would know if you were uh, uh, McDermott, if you were a Delaware company, you would know that the corporation cannot vote its treasury shares. So what was the issue in McDermott versus Lewis? So here we had a Delaware corporation. And as we discussed, there are uh, four ways to talk about shares. We have authorized shares. That's how many the company can issue. We have issued shares. Those are shares the company actually sells or gives to people. We have outstanding shares. Those are the ones that have not been repurchased, right, which are called treasury shares. Now, we discussed that you can't vote your treasury shares. Why not? Well, the board controls what the corporation does. The corporation owns the treasury shares, and the shares vote for the board. So it gets a little circular if, in fact, the board could vote its treasury shares. They'd always vote for themselves, right? I mean, probably. Does anyone here like to fire themselves? No, most people would probably vote, I get a raise, I keep my job, I get a nicer office, right? That's the kind of things you vote for when you vote for yourself, right? We don't have any of that discipline. So under Delaware law, you cannot vote treasury shares, and that's actually true of all United States jurisdictions, but it's not true of Panama. In Panama, anything goes. No, I don't. I don't know De Panama corporate law very well, but I do know this much. In Panama, a corporation can vote the treasury shares of its wholly owned or majority owned subsidiary. And that's not the law in America. Now, this aspect, the aspect of I, this is not a course in comparative international corporate law. So you can let it go in one ear and out the other that, that you know, that uh, Panama has this rule. What's important is which rule applies in this situation. So the, the facts of the rule are less important than the concept of which rule applies. Does the internal affairs doctrine affect things here? So I've got this really fun and complicated chart, which uh, I'll step through very briefly, which basically says that we had a Delaware company that reorganized, and now this was a subsidiary to a Panama company. And the question was, after this reorganization, where McDermott International held McDermott Delaware, could McDermott International which owned 92% of the McDermott Delaware shares, vote those shares? Could it vote the shares that it held of its subsidiary? If McDermott was a Delaware company, the answer would be no. But McDermott was a Panama company. So shareholders took this case to Delaware. You can see that from your case caption, 531 A. 2nd, 206 Delaware, 1987, case in Delaware court. And goes to the Delaware court and says, hey, Delaware court, the corporation is trying to vote its treasury shares. I'm not happy with that because they're not allowed to vote their treasury shares under Delaware law. And the question for Delaware is whether Delaware law or Panama law applies. And what's really interesting from the Delaware perspective, and prelude, California did the opposite. Delaware said, no, our law does not apply. Go take it to Panama. This is a Panama corporation. You are now the shareholders. They're up there, right? After the reorg, they voted for that. They agreed to that. They're now the shareholders of a Panama corporation. Panama law applies, and they can vote the shares. So this was Delaware upholding the internal affairs doctrine, saying that even though this means that we are losing control of this company, even though this means that these shareholders are subject to what we believe is a worse regime, because they have a law that says you can't do this. Right? Delaware's law says you can't vote these shares. But we're going to respect the internal affairs doctrine. Delaware is saying the internal affairs doctrine is even more important as a general matter than this specific rule. And the court goes through some reasoning here. It talks about due process. It talks about commercial, uh, uh, the commerce clause, the full faith and credit clause, and basically says that it's essential that shareholders and managers have certainty about what law applies. They need notice. Otherwise, these are fundamental rights. I mean, your right to vote for your director is a statutory right. Can the government take your statutory rights away without notice and process? 
No, that's state action in violation of the Constitution. That's the Constitution governing how corporate law can function. And so here the shareholders were on reasonable notice that this was a Panama corporation, should be subject to Panama rules, and yes, the Panama rules applied. And it goes through the reasoning of, of the constitutional reasoning for this. Mm -hmm. I was confused when I was reading this case, and I think I understand a little bit better now. So the, one of the shareholders was suing because the board of directors was able to use their treasury shares to vote for something. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. One of the shareholders was upset because the, the, the board of directors was essentially controlling the subsidiary. And if they were not permitted to vote treasury shares, the shareholders could control and might have taken the company in a different direction. So the shareholder was upset because they lost control of the company because Panama allows the voting of these treasury shares by the board. Yeah. Yeah, so let me actually move to that. That's, that's what happened in California. All right, so let's talk about that a little more explicitly. California has a statute that says, I have it here somewhere. It, it's a little wordy, but I'll, I'll you know, kind of go through it. Um, California has a statute, section 2115, which says a foreign corporation, by the way, what does a foreign corporation mean? Madeline, do you know? One that's not where it's, it's in a different state that's incorporated. Not necessarily a international company, but um, you know, we have a Google office here. Google is incorporated in Delaware. Google is located in Pennsylvania. From the perspective of Pennsylvania, Google is a foreign corporation. Could also, and is, right, could, is in California too. They have an office in Mountain View, in Mountain View, California. It's somewhere. Over there, right? Kind of where the bear is staring at. It's going to eat him right below the bay. So California has this odd statute, which essentially says, yeah, internal affairs, shmeh. And they reason that a foreign corporation is subject to the California Corporations Code. And they go and they have a test. If the average of the property factor, the payroll factor, and the sales factor is more than 50% during its last income and more than one half the outstanding student. Okay, whatever. They have a whole litmus test for this, essentially saying we're exerting our influence on corporations that are doing business and operating in our state. California is saying we don't respect the internal affairs doctrine, uh, at least with regards to companies that are operating here. Now, California is our uh, uh, a huge economy, right? I mean, it has an economy larger than many uh, nations, and so they get to exert their influence. Uh, and, and this really came out in, a, in, a, in an older state. I think it was actually kind of fun. I actually found a little cartoon on this. Sorry, it's a little small. The, uh, th this case of Louisiana Pacific uh, has a little character here, and Utah is saying, you may be bigger and stronger, but you can't force your laws on me, and California is saying, actually, I can. Because what do we have here? We have a Utah corporation doing business in California. So according to the Internal Affairs Doctrine, a Utah corporation doing business in California, which law applies according to the Internal Affairs Doctrine? Utah. Utah's laws apply, right? And if California respected the Internal Affairs Doctrine, that wouldn't be hard. But in fact, California has this statute which says we're going to exert our influence over companies within our ambit. And there is an important distinction between um, California law and uh, Utah law here. So under Utah law, um, the board, uh, the shareholders vote with a process called straight voting. And in California, there's something called cumulative voting. So I'll get to what those things are in a minute so you do understand them. But I don't want to go too far off track, right? First, we're just understanding, again, just like in the case of Panama, we don't care that much for the moment of what the difference in the law is, but which law applies whether the internal affairs doctrine is respected. So California requires cumulative voting. Utah requires straight voting. And we have this discussion in this case about which law applies. Now, this case is heard in California. The shareholder brought the suit in California. And um, they brought this suit because 
uh, cumulative voting would have given this shareholder more power. Same thing like in the case, right? Just like in the case of McDermott, the ability to vote treasury shares reduced the power of the shareholder, the shareholder sued to have those voting rights restored. Similarly, having the uh, California rule. So what happens here? California holds that California law may apply. Unsurprisingly, the California courts say California has the authority to ignore the internal affairs doctrine and impose its law on others. Now, it goes through the due process, it goes through the reasoning, and for those of you who are really interested in the nitty-gritty constitutional basis of the internal affairs doctrine, those are good cases for you to read carefully and compare with Delaware. For our purposes, right, for our basic overview purposes, I want you to understand that California essentially said the internal affairs doctrine does not apply for the following reasons. The full faith and credit clause does not uh, prevent California because California had uh, essentially minimum contacts. Think back to Penoyer versus Neff. Uh, that the Commerce Clause, uh, <clears throat> the effect on interstate commerce would be minimal, so the Commerce Clause did not prevent California from reaching into this Utah corporation. Uh, and it went through the Due Process and Equal Protection Clause and, and basically said that if every state in the country adopted our rule, there would be no conflict because it's a more than 50% rule. So if all 50 states adopted our rule, uh, we would know that we would have our corporations governed by the company, uh, the, 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 the state where it had the most uh, influence. And again, they go through the arguments here. Uh, I'm happy to talk about them offline, but, but you could just know that the California approach is a problem. The California approach is a problem because it interferes with this private choice. If the shareholders and the board made a private choice to be governed by straight voting, and uh, decided to become a corporation under the laws of Utah, now we have California interfering with that. This is the minority approach. It's sometimes called the California approach, and it stands for the notion that a corporation can uh, have its internal affairs governed by the state in which it is doing business, which is a very disfavored minority approach. But California, again, being very large, can uh, really assert its influence. New York, by the way, has a similar rule. It's not quite as toothy. There's one state in the country that has a very weird rule. There's one state in the country whose corporate law says, we will respect the internal affairs doctrine. They went out of their way to put a law on their books basically saying, we respect private choice. Which state in the union would be the most likely, do you think, to say, we stand for private choice? Yeah. Good, good guess. They already had that as, as law in the books, right? Uh, but they did not actually promulgate a statute to the legislature. De this is really important for Delaware. Next. Texas. It's Texas, right? The state that stands for private choice, private action, right? I mean, that's sort of their, their motto, and it was sort of a grandiose gesture that they made to sort of be the opposite of California with regard to this. Um, no, Delaware, though, comes up in vantage point partners. So I'll talk about that. This is the majority approach. Most states observe the internal affairs doctrine, and, and they provide the reasons I specified earlier. So in the case of examine, uh, again, we have um, the facts, I think, are helpful for you getting just a flavor uh, of the material. But here we have to do with uh, series voting. Uh, and, and we'll cover that when we cover uh, uh, class uh, cumulative voting as well. But essentially, uh, the question was whether or not uh, holders of a certain series of stock, we'll call it Series A, had the right to veto a deal. So there's two ways to think about stock in a company, and I'll put this board up a little higher. Actually, we're, you're going to, I'm getting ahead of the capital uh, structure lecture, which you will see in the videos, but this will be helpful for that. And then we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll do our cumulative voting thing. All right, so. When you sell stock, you can sell different types of stock. You can sell common stock, and you can also sell preferred stock. Now, this is really like the subject of my whole course on venture capital law, but we saw this in the basic waterfall. Common stock has essentially no rights and privileges aside from what's basic and statutory. Preferred stock, which is usually when you have large institutional investors making very significant individual uh, uh, 
purchases of stock usually comes with some preferences. Just so you know what they are, there's things like there's a liquidation preference, which means that if the company sells, you get paid first. Right? Company liquidates, turns from assets into cash. The preferred get that first. Not only do they get that first, but they often have a multiple, like they get two times their investal, in this, uh, investment back, and that all gets paid out before the common get anything. There's quite a number of preferences that have to do with being a preferred stockholder. And also, the way that venture capital investment works is it happens in stages. You don't get all the money at once. So you, know, you might start over here, and if you're lucky, someone gives you a million bucks. That's a lot of money to us, but it's not a lot of money for a startup. I mean, think about hiring 10 engineers. What are they going to, you know, they're going to want $150,000. This won't even be a one-year run rate. So maybe this is how you get started with a prototype. You hopefully will raise some more money at some point, and, and hopefully it'll be a larger amount because you'll be a bigger company. I mean, ideally, that keeps going up sort of exponentially, and you raise money in these series. Right, and they're typically referred to quite easily as series A, series B, series D, series C, series D. And at each stage, now these could be similar shareholders, but you know, maybe in series A, you ask grandma to invest, and she came up with 50,000 bucks. Go grandma. But grandma's not going to be able to keep playing that game as you start getting the $80 million range. So the investor makeup changes. In addition, there are just certain investors that tend to invest in very early stage companies, there are investors that tend to invest in later stage companies. The ones that invest later tend to get more preferences, or invite, they're getting more money, and they also get paid first, which means they are higher or lower risk, by the way. Higher or lower risk the later you invest? Lower. lower risk. Lower risk. They get paid first, for one thing. I mean, if the company is sold, if the company is sold for $100 million, and the Series D invested $80 million, and they have a liquidation preference, this is called a 1x, meaning they get all their money back before anyone else gets paid. 100 million, they get 80 million back. The company now has 20 million dollars. Who's getting shafted? Everyone over here gets nothing. So definitely riskier to be earlier stage. On the other hand, what are the advantages to investing in an early stage? Well, the price was probably a lot lower. I mean, a million dollars, probably came at a price of maybe a dollar a share, and by the time we get here, I don't know, five, 15, we're getting close to IPO, maybe we're at 40 here. So your potential for getting a big return on that investment, if the money does flow through, I mean, you paid a dollar, and let's say that, let's turn that number from a million into a billion. Now everyone's getting paid. And so you can make a bigger return on your investment. So that's the correlation of risk and reward. So the question, though, in this case, in Vantage Partners, is how do we count these votes? We have all these different kinds of shareholders. We have common shareholders. They own a certain kind of stock. We have Series A, Series B, Series D, Series, series C, Series D. And under the Delaware approach, unless the Certificate of Incorporation says otherwise, we're going to pool all these votes together. OK? We're going to pull all these votes together, and each share gets one vote. And that's how you make decisions on things, like whether to sell the company. All right. Let's say the company wants to sell for $100 million. Who wants to sell this company for $100 million? Does the Series D want to sell this company? Well, probably they're getting all their money out, right? As I mentioned, the Series D are getting all their money. Uh, how about the, let's put this at 20, okay? Let's put it, the Series C, they're getting all their money. They're getting all their liquidation preference plus whatever other kind of return do they want to sell? Yeah, they probably want to sell too. But what about these guys over here, which are getting goose egg? Do you want to sell the company for nothing? Do you want to watch some other people get rich? No, right? So these guys are going to vote no. These guys are going to vote yes. If we require a series vote, if the series B get a vote on their own, they will vote unanimously no. Except to the extent, I guess, they're also Series C holders. Set that aside for a minute. And so if it's a series vote, the merger doesn't happen. Each one of these series has to approve that vote. If, and so if, um, we're against, what, California again? Yeah. So if California law applies, in this case, the merger doesn't happen. That's a big deal. If Delaware law applies, however, we aggregate all these votes, 
And it turns out, the way the math works out, that the major it's the majority rule. There are more votes up here than down here. And so if we're under straight voting, meaning we just add all these together, if we add all these together, then the merger passes. So this is a big deal, right? Series voting can have a huge impact on corporate decisions. And if you're a Series B shareholder, you might go try your luck in court and sue for it, right? So what happened in examine? So we have this quasi-California corporation, uh, section 2115 ostensibly applies, and the uh, court goes to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the injured party or the, the party that uh, is, says they're entitled to this series vote under California law goes to the Delaware court. It goes to Delaware court and says that they're entitled to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, actually, I, this is a weird case, I apologize, a weird procedural fact, the plaintiff is looking for declaratory judgment that the, the right does not exist. So just kind of a flip on the parties. Um, but the point is that uh, they take the issue to uh, which state's law applies. And this really matters because if you have serious voting, the merger is going to fail. If you have uh, collective voting, uh, the merger is going to pass and someone's going to end up with nothing for all their investment. Well, you might not be too surprised. Delaware finds that Delaware law applies. But they didn't just, again, they, didn't all, they don't always find Delaware law applies. They found Panama law applies. The Delaware court once again said, we believe in the internal affairs doctrine. And the internal affairs doctrine shall govern the operations of the business. So I think this hopefully then answers your question, which is what happens you know, if, in different courts? And the answer is basically, Delaware will uphold the internal affairs doctrine regardless of where that law tends to apply and California tends to enforce and impose its own laws, its 2115 statute onto the parties if they have that uh, quasi-California status. Yeah? So where it says class voting on this page, that's series voting essentially? Uh, yes. So yeah, class or series, meaning each of these get a separate vote and they have to pass each of these gates to achieve that. Now, I will also point out that you could have a certificate of incorporation that gave that right. They could have negotiated for that right. The problem with the uh, defendant in this case, the one who was seeking the right, my problem with them is that they didn't bargain for that right. If they had bargained for that at the time of buying the stock, that could have been put in the charter or maybe that got wiped out later when another investor came and put more money. But there was a different bargain that was struck and they were looking to get a better deal than what they negotiated for. And so the court goes on to say that the internal affairs doctrine is not only a conflicts of law principle, but it's, it's fundamentally important for constitutional purposes. And, um, and of course, uh, as uh, Joseph pointed out, this is also important for Delaware. I mean, think about it from Delaware's perspective selfishly for a minute. From Delaware's perspective, if the internal affairs doctrine doesn't apply, who gives a hoot about Delaware? Right? No one actually does business in Delaware except the filing agents that like, you know, need to be there because they serve the corporations there. I mean, as far as I can tell, the only thing Delaware does is incorporate businesses and charge a huge toll when you go to New York. Right? I mean, that bridge is like the most expensive bridge I've ever been through. And that's basically their entire revenue source, right? Uh, and losing their corporations would be a huge blow. So it should be unsurprising that Delaware supports the internal affairs doctrine. I will point out that they do have a solid foundation in constitutional law, not a constitutional law scholar per se. So you can take my word for it or do your own research and write a paper on it, you know, if you, if you don't agree or compare the two cases. Also totally legitimate fodder. But I think it is well supported. And more fundamentally, I think it, it's attuned with our notions of fairness and about notice. Because what the shareholder was trying to do here, they were trying to get a benefit they didn't bargain for or that they lost out. They, couldn't, they didn't pay to play. That wasn't the situation that they had expected and they're hoping to get something more from it by saying California law applies. Um, all right, so that's... So let's talk then about what this other California quirk is, which is going to be cumulative voting. 
and I'll just do a quick demo on this, and then I think we have some time for discussion. Okay. So class voting uh, uh, and single voting, and now we'll talk about uh, cumulative voting and straight voting. So Delaware allows for straight or cumulative voting, but California requires cumulative voting, and I'm going to explain what that is, but I'm actually going to first ask for a volunteer. Joe, thanks. So Joe, you're going to vote, you're going to, you're going to vote for a slate of directors here. And uh, Cassandra, can you run the opposite slate? Uh, again, so Joe's going to vote, and I want you to try to vote for a different set of directors, right? You have your slate of directors, Joe has his slate of directors. Now, Joe, you're, you raised your hand first, so I'm going to make you the majority shareholder. You have 60 shares, okay? Cassandra, you have 40 shares, okay? So that's how many votes you get in straight voting. In straight voting, for each open seat, one, one seat, one vote. And we're going to have five seats. We have five board seats available, and just for simplicity, I'm gonna, we're going to call them either votes for J or for C, depending on how many votes you want to cast. Now, let's start with straight voting because it's easier to understand. You're going to vote in straight voting for each position separately, and each time you can vote up to all your shares. So, Joe, how many shares would you like to vote for your director? 19. Just 19? Yeah. Yeah, but you, can, but you have 60 votes per seat. 60. 60, okay. How about you? How many votes would you like to vote here? You're going to vote 40. Okay, so who wins? That's one for Joe. Joe, next director, how many votes would you like to cast? 60. 60, that sounds good. Sandra? 40. 40? Uh-oh, I think Joe wins again. How about number three? 60. 60? Huh, this is not looking good. I'm, I'm going to guess you're going to 40. Yeah, Joe's going to win that seat. Okay. Number five? 60. 60. I'm shocked. No one started with 30, 40, doesn't matter, you know? Yeah. 42 is the meaning of life, right? Okay, you get the idea. Under straight voting, the majority shareholder wins every seat. Under straight voting, the majority shareholder wins every seat because if you have 51 out of 100 shares, if you have 501 out of 1,000 shares, if you have 5 million and 1 out of 10 million shares, you vote those shares, each vote is a separate vote, and you win. Cumulative voting works a bit differently. With cumulative voting, you get a number of votes, which is the number of seats times the number of shares, which you allocate across the entire board. So the math's a little bit funkier, and I'll just write it up here for everyone. So, uh, Joe, you have uh, 60 shares, sure. and we have five seats. Well, we got 300 votes. Yep. Okay. Sandra, you got 40. Now you've got 200 votes. All right. Now let's try to play this out. And I'll tell you what, this game is a little different. So, how many seats do you want to put on that first director? How many votes of your 300 that cumulatively do you want to put for your first director, Joe? Seven zero. Seventy five. Okay. And Can someone help me out and just um, we'll just well, you know maybe I'll do it over here. So uh, so now minus seventy five equals two two five. Okay. I'm gonna run out of space pretty quick. Seventy six. Oh, you wanted to win something for a change. I'm shocked. So you just won a seat. Okay. Minus seventy six equals one twenty four. All right, Joe. How many you want to put on the next seat? 75, 75, at least you made my life slightly easier. So now we've got, what, uh, 150 and uh, 75. So you have, seven, so you have uh, right, minus 150. Yeah. Cassie, how do you want to vote? Zero? You're going give to that, give that one up? It's nice to be able to go second, right? That, that helps. That's not how that works in reality. You'd coast them simultaneously, but... How many on, how many on number three? Zero again. Okay, so it looks like we've got... And Joe, you've got 75 votes left, right? Mm -hmm. I'll do 50 and 25. 
Okay. Cassie, you've got 124 votes left. How do you want to allocate those? <laughs> it's a little, I don't think you can do that. Uh, 76, right? So, uh, 26. Oh, 26. Oh, okay. All right. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Congratulations, Cassandra. So, cumulative voting. Cumulative voting has the important impact of giving minority shareholders more power. And California, in their infinite wisdom, decided that that's what corporations should do. They should give power to the minority, power to the people. Delaware said, let's have a choice. And so this kind of thing can really matter because as you can see, if you have a California corporation, let's say, Joe, you were the major investor, you don't want to lose control of this board. Would you invest in this company in the first place? Maybe not. Or if you did, you might have to invest a supermajority. It's harder to maintain control of a California company, because minorities have more rights to vote out the directors. Now, that isn't necessarily good or bad. I, I get a little facetious with California, because I practice there, and they're really annoying to deal with, and the Secretary of State never answers the damn phone, and you know, at least you can bill for it, but, oh, just forever. No. Uh, he doesn't answer my calls at all, actually. But you call the Secretary of State, and it rings and rings, and you can't get an answer, and there's no way to expedite your filings, and like you, they, you, you have like a merger that day, and just heaven forbid it's with a California company, because you'll never know when the merger certificate's going to get approved, whereas Delaware can do it in an hour for a small $2,000 fee, which, you know, when you're dealing with these numbers, it's chump change. Anyway, point being, I get a little sore thing about California, and, and I don't, and I, I prefer, you know, as you see my Ben, you, know, you have a choice. You have a choice in Delaware. If, if, if shareholders preferred cumulative voting, we would expect to see it more often. But in fact, what do we see? We see mainly straight voting. And so uh, these type of rules and these internal affairs doctrines can actually make a pretty significant difference in terms of control for a company. Now, sneak preview for next semester when you're learning about fiduciary duties and shareholder lawsuits. Everything we talked about today, everything we talked about today involving the internal affairs has to do with the rights of shareholders with regard to voting, right? We've talked about cumulative voting, straight voting, appointing directors, who votes shares, all about corporate control, all about shareholders' rights. All of these would be litigated as a direct action. Derivative actions are when the corporation is harmed, like when the stock value goes down. Direct actions are when shareholders are harmed directly. All of these examples that I gave you today are examples of direct actions because the shareholders were harmed. They were saying, my rights as a shareholder, my rights to vote were diminished. And so they would conduct an action as shareholders, not on behalf of the company. They don't have to allege, and it doesn't matter if the stock price went down. On the other hand, what are we looking at when we're talking about suing the director of Papa John's? We're talking about harming stock value. That's a derivative action. That's a harm to the corporation. The shareholders feel it in their, in their, in their uh, money, right? I don't know if that's a, the expression. You feel it in your money? I, don't, I think I just made that up. So they feel it in their, in their wallets, right? Uh, but they don't feel it in terms of their, of their rights. And so those would be derivative actions. So anyway, we'll talk much more about that next semester. But all of this internal affairs has to do with uh, direct actions. Um, mm -hmm. So is this, you know, is Delaware doing the right thing, the wrong thing? There's some more in the book about that. It's a really old debate. Um, you know, one of the things I thought about when I started in academia is, do I, do I want to write something about that? And they, my answer was no. It's like, it's, it's been unresolved for like 30 years, and you've got like, you know, titans slinging mud against each other about, about what's right and what's wrong. I can tell you my own personal view is that the fact that companies choose to incorporate in Delaware shows me that the market is preferring Delaware. And that tends to show that Delaware is doing something right. Companies are choosing to incorporate there, and people are choosing to invest there. And that suggests to me that Delaware is doing something right with regard to its corporate law, which respects the internal affairs doctrine, which provides notice and certainty, which accounts for private choice. Those all seem to be things that shareholders value and managers value that are valuable about corporations. So I tend to be a fan. This is one of the reasons I focus as much as I do on Delaware law. I come down on that on the side that I think that this has been a race to the top. Of course, 
My opinion's not the only opinion or even the right opinion. There's a lot of debate out there. So if you'd like to write about what's wrong with Delaware, there's plenty of scholarship there. And we are in kind of a brave new world, so to speak, because uh, what's happened in the meantime is that limited liability companies have become more and more important. This is a course on corporations, but small businesses tend to incorporate differently. They tend not to incorporate. They tend to form is the correct term. You incorporate a corporation, you form a company. They tend to form as uh, limited liability companies, and they tend not to do that. They tend not to do that in Delaware. They tend to do that in their home state. All right, so um, main points from this chapter, and then I got a video to hopefully prompt some discussion. Oh, questions, yeah. Of yeah. So in the vantage point, I don't see why the shareholders couldn't just seek venue in California. Uh, oh, so you're going to get me on the venue question. Civil procedure, why didn't they get venue in California? They would have won there. Don't know the answer to that. I don't know why they were not eligible for venue in California. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. My, my, civil, my, my corporate civil procedure has escaped me there. You want to write about it? You got it. There you go. No, probably not. Um, they might have thought they would win in Delaware. There's also strategic reasons to, to try to have a case in Delaware. The Delaware courts generally dispose of issues faster. Uh, it's far less expensive to litigate in Delaware. You're going to go through a panel of expert judges. You go directly to the Court of Chancellery that exclusively or almost exclusively hears corporate cases. They've disposed of cases in a month that you would be stuck in California for years. And if you're looking for an injunction and you want to prevent a merger from happening and there's real risk of losing your money, um, that may be a reason strategically to go to Delaware. I, I don't know the answer to the venue question, but that was, I think it was a pretty good you know, punt on that. Right? Okay, so main points of the chapter. Any, well, any questions actually before I go on, just to kind of sum up and then discussion. So corporate law developed over time and it's developed toward a more liberal attitude toward forming corporations. And Delaware has sort of led the charge in that. There are some federal laws that we'll learn about as we go along that pertain to corporations, mostly with regard to securities. Uh, and um, next year, we'll have additional offerings in securities regulations. Thankfully, Professor Echeverry has joined us. He teaches the other section of corporations, and he does a lot of work with public securities. And so that's an area where the federal government is heavily involved in corporations. But we also have the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002, Dodd-Frank of 2010. And if you're within any particular industry area, like healthcare, there can also be a lot of laws there. But in general, it's a state law doctrine. And the fundamental premise is that the state in which you're incorporated governs your internal affairs. Everywhere but California, and to a limited extent, New York, respects that doctrine and finds that that is uh, constitutionally necessary. The Supreme Court hasn't, uh, hasn't resolved that one yet. It has somewhat to do with the debate between whether corporations are property or social institutions, uh, <clears throat> because if they are social institutions, we might feel more comfortable with allowing states to seize some control and to force them to do things. If we see them more as personal property, we would be less comfortable with states imposing themselves on them. But yes, the main doctrine from today, you need to know about the internal affairs doctrine, this concept that uh, Delaware will respect uh, the rules of the country in which, or the, the state in which the company is incorporated, whether that's Panama or Delaware, or for that matter, if you're crazy enough to incorporate in California, you can, uh, uh, you, 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 they will respect that. Del California especially um, tries to regulate these pseudo foreign corporations, and there's some constitutional challenges to doing that that I invite you to consider. Um, is this good? Is this bad? Are, are things getting better, getting worse? Um, Long-standing debate. I come down on the side of, you know, look at the market, look at the fact people are continuing to choose Delaware. Uh, they have more and more choices. In fact, there are additional choices with alternate forms, limited liability companies, L3Cs, incorporating internationally, incorporating in Ireland, doing all these things. People are still choosing Delaware. There must be some reason for that. Some will say it's the Delaware courts. Some will say it's the Delaware statutes. Some will say it's to screw shareholders. So those are all you know, various valid uh, views.